David Yang and Nimit Maru are the founders of Full Stack Academy, a 13-week immersive coding bootcamp based in New York. They were in the summer 2012 Y Combinator class. David and Nimit, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Great to be here, Jeff. Yeah, uh, great to be here. I'd like to start off by talking about Full Stack Academy. How did you get the idea for the company? Well, I think you know there was um, the kind of three things that that happened all simultaneously. One, we were um, Nimit had just graduated from Wharton, and we were sitting around, kind of saying, uh, "What should we do next?" You know, it's so hard to find engineers to do the things we want to do, and we're kind of almost like in a comic sketch. We kept coming back to this idea that there's just not enough engineers in the field, and then we looked at things that we liked doing. We liked we had um, been managers, uh, CTO type roles, and had mentored a lot of engineers. And really enjoyed that, and then at the same time, at um, every time I visited Nimit at Wharton, his friends would, you know, beg us to kind of give these classes on how to like tell us about coding, tell us about software development. So we started doing that at business schools, and then from that, um, that was a genesis of you know we're like let's go all the way, let's create a program that we can really create great software developers quickly, um, and that's how Full Stack Academy w- w- was born. And so as the as the project has evolved into a real business. Have you noticed that a lot of business school type people are starting to enroll in full stack? We've had a, we actually have an incredible diversity of backgrounds uh, of people who enroll. Um, I would say there's a large chunk of people who have um, some kind of quantitative background, whether it's, you know, in, in uh, math or statistics or some kind of uh, engineering field. Um, there's a good number of people who have business backgrounds like finance, um, in general, like our admissions process filters out anyone who um, is not um, is not. I mean, there's one layer of, of filter of just passion and, and hard worker, but also like the ability and you know the ability to grasp these coding concepts. And so, um, so I think we do have we definitely do have people who have done MBAs in the past, but but you know all our students tend to be people who. Um, who at some point in their life have been tinkerers, or maybe they were even programmers at one point, and they um, and they ended up going on the business side or, or something like that. Do you require experience specifically with coding? So, I mean, when you say the word experience, uh, we don't require professional experience with coding, uh, but we do require that people have experience with coding. So we don't, you know, we don't accept people who are quote unquote beginners, um, and I don't. Um, and I don't mean that in the bad way, because of course all of us were beginners at, at some point. Um, but what we found is that the period where you're just beginning to learn is a very um, is a little bit unpredictable. Like it's hard to know how long that period will go on for, and and actually it's also a period of discovery for that person themselves. Like are they do they really love it? Are they really enjoying this process? Um, and so we want them to go through that early period either on their own or in some other kind of part time class. You know we have other classes for people who are just starting out. Um, but by the time people enter Full Stack Academy, um, you know, most of them have months, if not years, of you know, some kind of amateur um, programming experience. So why do you teach JavaScript as the foundation for Full Stack Academy? So we actually, um, you know, when we were initially designing the curriculum, we looked around at a lot of things. We, uh, I come from a Ruby on Rails background, really enjoyed spending um, I'd say almost 10 years of my career working in, or maybe not 10, but many years of my career working in Rails. Nimit had uh, recently sold a company that had done a lot of Python and Django. And so we were coming, from, and then we both have done Java, C. Um, so we looked at a lot of different things. Um, one thing, a few things about JavaScript are really exciting. One is that it's, uh, it's just u- ubiquitous, right? It's everything from robots, um, you know, microcontrollers, uh, like the Arduino stuff that w- they're doing with NodeBots um, to, of course, the web browser. So I feel like in some sense, JavaScript is like English, right? It hitched itself to the most powerful you know, horse in the history of mankind, the web, you know, the web, and has really exploded since then. And then the other thing is that JavaScript, um, because of its ubiquity, it's just, it runs the into- all the components that are needed for a modern web stack. And so you can, you know, from the Mongo command line using JavaScript, uh, running Node on the back end, uh, JavaScript in the front end, all the stuff that's going on in the front end that's really exciting around, you know, I think tools like Angular, React, um, single page applications. And so our students not only get to use a tool that is 
you know, very heavily used in the professional world, but they get to learn one language really well and use it everywhere they want to use it initially. There is something called Atwood's Law that states that anything that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript eventually. Do you agree with that? <laughs> it's definitely true at full stack. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I think he used that deridingly because JavaScript has kind of got a bad rep in the develop developer community. Um, and, I, and I think deservedly so. It was, um, it was for many years kind of the, you know, the scripting language the leftover scripting language. But I think now with the investments that all the companies are doing, are putting into JavaScript, the uh, work on um, JavaScript engines, the work by the TC39 group on standards and ES6, ES7, I think JavaScript has really become a first-class first language on its own. And um, I think we'll see more and more engineers want to use JavaScript as their first language. When you hear the phrase, JavaScript is the new bytecode, what does it make you think of? It makes me think that um, hopefully, I, so it makes me think of asm.js, which means that eventually, you know, let's give people choice again in the browser. And so, you know, let's write a Ruby interpreter, a Go interpreter, a, you know, whatever language you want to run, you can run um, compiled down to JavaScript and using things like, you know, asm.js, run, high, you know, highly performant other languages in the front end. And I think that that's a, a venerable goal, and we'll probably see that more and more. Um, that's what it makes me think of. I don't know if Nimit has a different answer. No, I, I think that's fair. Asm.js is WebAssembly, is that correct? Yes, yes. I think it's become the WebAssembly standard. Can you describe what that is? Like, what is the goal of WebAssembly, and where are they in development right now? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on WebAssembly. Uh, my perception of it, or my understanding of it, is that there's just some things in the JavaScript language that if you want to build you know, a bytecode type language on it, you can't get the performance that you need. Um, for example, how integers are happening, um, you know, controlling whether the computer views a number as an integer or as a float. Uh, you don't get that control in JavaScript, but Asm.js lets you have that, um, or WebAssembly lets you have that. And so if you want to build a, a, you know, a virtual machine on top of a language, you need to have those kind of levels of control. Interesting. So how do you think the learning process for your students differs in teaching JavaScript versus how it might be if you were to teach Ruby on Rails to these introductory programmers? I think um, what we've seen in, um, you know, in seeing, I think something like 13 or 14 classes now go through full stack, um, is that Early on in the learning process, uh, it's very important to reduce the number of variables that change um, so that people can really dive deeply into the things that matter. And one of those key variables early on is that there are so many different languages and technologies that are involved in like, you know, even launching a, a simple web application. Um, and so, you know, one of the benefits of using full stack JavaScript is that you use the same language across the stack um, and so that someone can get really good at at, at JavaScript and be able to, you know, learn the entire ecosystem of, of an application. Um, that was one of the main downsides that that uh, that we see educationally with Ruby on Rails is that is that you know Ruby on Rails itself is very good at generating HTML and CSS, uh, but when we when it comes to the front end, you suddenly have to be you know in order to use something like Angular or React really well, you you have to be a JavaScript expert, and if you've spent half of your or even more than that time just being good at Ruby, suddenly JavaScript is like a whole new world. Um, and so you, you end up being a little bit of like a jack of both rather than really good at one thing. Um, and so that's why we, we, we strongly feel that uh, full stack JavaScript is, is the right way to, um, to, to run our school, basically. Yeah. So in, oh, go ahead. I was going to say one analogy that um, I think about is like if you're you know, trying to become a doctor and everything in cardiology is in Latin and everything in neurology is in Greek, it just it's another thing that's slowing you down from learning the things that you want to learn, which is really you know how the body functions and how to you know make positive improvements to it. So it's um, by having one language across the entire stack because in the end, if they want to, to be in web development, they need to know JavaScript. And so uh, rather than having someone who's pretty good at Ruby, pretty good at JavaScript, we have people who are really really good at JavaScript, and we find out that it's not that hard for them to learn other languages. Um, especially Ruby is a pretty friendly language to learn. Um, I also just this is very specific to Ruby versus JavaScript, but the Rails community tends to be very. Um, I don't want to say I don't like to I don't like to use the term magic. It's not magic, but 
they, they tend to, you know, the convention over configuration. I like that as a developer, but as someone learning, if you don't, you have to learn so many conventions before you know like what's happening in this particular file, which can be mm. daunting. Yeah, interesting. So in a Quora post, uh, one of you wrote, I can't remember which one of you it was, but you said JavaScript code is, for lack of a better word, uglier. But to write it, the programmer clearly has to have a deeper understanding of how arrays and loops work. Could you explain this in more detail? Why why does JavaScript code necessitate an understanding of how arrays and loops work? Um, I have to go back and kind of look that up. But um, I think there's, I mean, there's some things that are JavaScript definitely makes um, harder to read than than Ruby. For example, one thing I think is that clear is like a, how you handle asynchronous versus synchronous operations, right? Like the fact that Ruby lets you just block, um, whereas JavaScript is mostly non-blocking syntax, is really hard for um, for beginners to mm. kind of think about and, and manage. I think in that particular example, I was thinking about something like, um, you know, Ruby gives you a lot of array comprehensions, like each, you know, a lot of kind of array helper functions. Yes. Um, and so that might like, that might be what I was referring to, or wh whatever that post was referring to. Yeah, so in Ruby, there were, you know, a, a new programmer have to do all this disambiguation, like to understand that all these different syntactic sugar things actually mean the same thing. Yeah, I, I, but I don't think we were implying that Ruby programmers don't understand like for loops and, and looping, but you know, it's like there's a lot more ways to do things that um, kind of a lot more syntactic sugar things that hide kind of the underlying mechanics. What are the downsides to teaching JavaScript? Oh, I would say for sure it's the um, it's the async stuff early on. Um, you know, we, we well, I mean the the downside there being that it's it's confusing. Yeah, it's um, confusing early yeah. on. Yeah, and I think you know the thing about programming is that it's in Ruby mostly you're kind of setting up the environment as you're reading as you imagine you're reading a Ruby let's say an active record model. Are a um, you know a Rails controller, right? You're kind of setting up the environment in your mind, understanding the different business rules that you're trying to um, to deal with. But um, it's pretty you can read it kind of top to bottom and then jump into specifics. Whereas in JavaScript, um, if you don't know tools like promises, like the async library, like you know how to use um, how to use those well, um, you know the code tends to kind of be a lot more interwoven in terms of the linearity of the code in the file versus the how it actually executes. That's one thing that I think programmers in JavaScript early on have to just, you know, get over. Um, that's one of the hard things. I mean, especially some of our students who come from more, um, you know, like I guess the, the more traditional languages, if I can call them that, backgrounds, um, it's like they're, they're not used to thinking in the asynchronous way. Um, and so it's just that, that shift is, is uh, it's surprisingly easier for newer students because you know that's kind of just how you know how they're learning to to think. Mm -hmm. um, but like you know, someone who's coming from like C programming um, is not used to thinking about functions in the way that JavaScript programmers do. Um, that's true. High order functions are kind of another thing that I think Ruby. You know, you have lambdas and, and um, procs, procs. They're yeah. used pretty rarely. Uh, I mean, sorry, not lambdas and, uh, and blocks. They're, they're used pretty often, but. Um, the idea of passing around kind of high order functions is such a common thing in JavaScript. It's a little bit of a mental jump for um, some early, you know, early on in, in the. Um, usually, by the time they get to our program, they've gone through a foundations course that has kind of really drills those concepts into them. But um, we do get a lot of people who, you know, it's something that they kind of have to wrap their mind around over time. Do you teach students the difference between interpreted and compiled languages? So we do show them compiled languages. We kind of walk them through the history of assembly, C, um, and then talk about things like Java versus JavaScript. But um, would I say that they have a deep understanding of that difference? You know, I think a lot of times, some do, some don't. I think um, they, last night we had a talk actually from someone from Twilio, and one of the students asked, you know, what is the difference between transpiled and compiled languages? And I think that, you know, would they have a good sense of where along the spectrum everything was? I think it's 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 gotten blurry even for regular developers. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't say they they just lack of experience in terms of using compiled languages. Um, they wouldn't kind of have that in, innate 
innate like visceral feeling about the difference. So what are the most complex topics that you end up exploring at Full Stack Academy? Hmm. I mean, you mentioned asynchronicity. Do you get into like distributed systems topics? Let's see. You know, or mach I, machine learning or. I think we, um, so I think the, the structure of our course is that we spend the first six weeks covering a lot of um, tools that web developers use. And then we go in and rebuild the tools um, kind of by hand. And so that's that's one pedagogical method that we really believe in. So when before, you know, you'll use a database and then you'll write your own database engine, right? And so they'll write, you know, how do you store stuff? How do you get stuff to the disk? How do you make high performance queries? Um, you'll use a promise library, write your own promise library. So you really understand, you know, what does it mean to be a deferred object? What does it mean to kind of resolve yourself into promises? Um, what else will they build? Um, they'll build their own um, kind of front end MVC library. Um, so they'll kind of, before they use Angular and after they use, they've used jQuery, they build something that kind of is reminiscent of Backbone. So they kind of understand the historical progression of why these things are even, why these tools are even so, um, why we even have these tools by building kind of a lightweight version of that tool. Uh, now, some of the things that you're talking about, distributed systems, um, machine, machine learning, learning yeah. those are things that students will explore in the second half of the program. And so we've had students who've um, published, you know, JavaScript data um, statistics libraries, machine learning um, tools for JavaScript, but there's nothing that kind of is curriculum led um, directly so by us. The second semester is is much more project driven, and in, in that and there there are three three kind of basic projects that people do, and um, and we don't you know we we definitely don't limit them to using the technologies that that we use in the first half of the. Of the uh, of the course, because I mean, we have to pick something to I guess uh, you know to I guess teach the stack. Uh, but but people people do everything from you know writing mobile app application generators to to like what David is saying, um, you know, the libraries to do different things that they're interested in. Um, and so they're they're they you know we really want them to get into the mindset of of um, what problem do I want to solve versus. You know what problem do I want to solve, and what technologies do I need to use to solve that problem, versus what technologies do I know how to use, and what problems can I solve with those technologies? Um, so we'd rather have them use the latter rather than the former. So that, um, and I think that's how you know developers in the in the industry really function is that um, that you know you you can learn you know you can kind of learn anything that you need to learn, um, but the important thing is the problems that you need to solve. So, how does Full Stack Academy differ from other coding boot camps? I think that um, you know our. I would say some of the you know I can start with some of the things that are similar, which is that um, that our our time structure is similar in the sense that we're all about um, around uh, three months, give or take a few weeks, um, and and probably um, our price structure is similar, uh, or the the way that you know we. We enroll students, um, but I think you know some of the ways that we differ, uh, you know, from from really day one is that um, is that we we were never really a school for beginners, which you know most most coding boot camps are, um, and so we've always placed a very high cost even in our own internal operations on, on admissions, um, and so we have we have two um, kind of coding based interviews uh, before someone gets in, um, and and we. Um, and we also have a very rigorous um, kind of pre pre full stack course that they have to go through. Like a lot of schools say that they have you know quote unquote pre work, uh, but it's usually just a list of resources for people to go to um, and and kind of read. And then they kind of assume you know assume that people have done only like half or a quarter of that stuff when they start. Uh, whereas whereas for our for our students uh, we have. A very rigorous four-week course that they do before, and and on their first week, there's actually an exam on that course, um, and you know that course covers um, it covers basically JavaScript theory and, and JavaScript uh, fundamentals, things like um, you know really the the basics of JavaScript like closures, functional programming, object-oriented programming with JavaScript, um, and there's an exam on on that course in the first week, and if they 
we don't even collect the tuition until they pass that exam. Um, so we really want to know that that they are actually prepared to 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 succeed in this course. And I think that we're probably one of the most academically rigorous programs out there uh, because we've you know we don't um, like I feel like even when we in, invite employers to our hiring day. We are, you know, we are kind of making a promise to them that people who are graduating from our program are of a certain caliber and have had a certain um, kind of training and selection process. And so, and so, we would much rather have a class that's that's a little smaller than um, than kind of kill the golden, you know, goose in a sense by just accepting everyone. Um, and so, I think that's one of the main differences. Um, the other thing that we've been talking about here, which is, you know, the stack that we teach, full stack JavaScript, I think that's also a, like a very basic difference. Um, you know, I do recognize that the stack is not supremely important in the long term, though. Like, it's totally possible that in a few years we'll be teaching something else, uh, you know, that we think is relevant and, and you know, like great academically. Um, but I think that's fundamentally different. Like, I do think it's um, full stack JavaScript is, you know, is kind of the right way to, to, to learn in this format. Um, and so I think that our students... Um, Kind of benefit from that, and, and that that's why we teach that stack. Um, any other any other thoughts, David? I think yeah. I think um, I go back to admissions and academic rigor. Um, we definitely have probably one of the hardest admissions um, admissions processes that I've seen or heard of out there. We we often hear from our students that um, you know instead of going to another boot camp, they didn't get into us one or two times, and they wanted to come here exclusively because of how hard it is to get in. Wow. So, do you do you get a lot of computer science students that end up coming into your boot camp, like people that come out of a computer science education and just don't know how to code? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Actually, this summer, um, you know, so we had um, a lot of, so uh, like the the class that recently graduated from the summer, about half of them were were uh, or maybe about yeah somewhere around half of them were were computer science students from um, who were actually in college and they were they were kind of uh, they were either juniors or sophomores who were who were taking a semester to um, to do this and and like what we heard overwhelmingly from from those students is that like you know just doing one semester here is gonna you know almost like doubles the value of their four year degree because while they you know they do get a lot of theoretical foundations in college but you know college really doesn't have um, time or incentive to cover like you know actual implementation trends and I think that's that's something that um, we do extremely well compared to um, you know compared to like a traditional CS education so I think that's that's definitely a diplomatic interpretation of the difference <laughs> between a computer science education in college versus a coding boot camp education but I mean my feelings are a little more harsh like I I feel like it's kind of a failing of the computer science ivory tower that people come out of a four-year degree and don't know how to code. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I was recently a, uh, a, a adjunct professor at Columbia, and I think the students there, you know, they're very good, but they're mostly figuring these things out on their own outside of class. Yeah, and um, you know, like things like GitHub, right? It's not, it's used in like very few of their classes, um, and we see this from a lot of students. You know, get like GitHub. I can't, I can, I can't imagine coding without version control, and a lot of students, version, you know, to them, version control is zipping files every five minutes. <laughs> directly, right? Um, and I think, you know, application architecture, working together in teams, these are all things that schools are, um, you know, some schools are exploring. And I have to give credit to um, the professor at Columbia. They're doing a lot of really innovative stuff with this kind of work. But, yeah, I think there's a lot of computer science students who, um, I hear this all the time. Like, I got, I learned more here in the first six weeks than I had learned in the first two years in my CS program. Do you, do you think the future of college is more of like an unbundled thing where every class is like an a la carte boot camp and you don't have this big batch degree? I mean, I think that's a, that's, <laughs> that's a, a, that's a, yeah. That's a, a, uh, I guess it's, it's kind of a loaded question in a sense. I'm not sure if that's <laughs> the, the, the future, but I think, um, you know, I do think college administrators themselves and everyone outside is kind of questioning this idea of like, why is every single degree in college four years long? Like, you know, who, who came up with this number of four years? Um, and like, you know, why does everybody have to fit into that map? And is that really the best time? You know, is that really the best way for everyone to learn? It's just like front loading four years of education. And then, um, yeah. And, you know, so, so the, the other day I was, I was actually, um, looking through, you know, I was asking 
a similar question. I was looking through my college transcript. Um, so David and I both went to University of Illinois. Um, I was a CS major there. Um, and I was looking through my transcript and like, would you guess, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you, what, what percentage of my classes do you think were CS classes as far as the number of credits? Like what percentages, what percentage of my credits were computer science credits? What would you say? Oh, let's see. So four years, let's say you take three CS classes per, per, or you take six CS classes per year. So 24, so 72 hours, maybe 72 credits. But out of, out of, uh, I think in total you need about 120 or something. So you're yeah. saying like a little over half, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's actually about 32% huh. of my, of my credits were computer science. And, and I was, you know, and I, I definitely did more than like the minimum requirements of, I was even doing some independent study research projects and stuff like that. And so it, so, I mean, I was pretty shocked and amazed at that number because there's so much, I mean, it's really a liberal arts education. And so I don't, you know, I don't, I think college is, is good for what it is, which is, you know, helping at that time, it was probably good for me. I was 18 years old. I was learning about myself and about community and stuff like that. And it was a, it was a good way to grow as a person. Um, but if you think about as a computer scientist, it's probably not the most efficient way to learn, um, learn kind of these skills. And so yeah, I, cause, think, cause it's not branded as a summer camp. It's branded as like an ivory tower institution. This is the only place you're going to learn these esteemed subjects. And that's not what it is. It's a summer camp. There's, we wrap up so much into the college experience as a society, right? We think there's a benefit of training our citizens in the, you know, liberal arts. There's a benefit of kind of giving students a chance to explore them, uh, you know, independence in a safe way. Um, I think, you know, training the citizens, Training a citizenry um, in liberal arts is a great ideal, but at the cost of colleges right now, it's it like it's breaking families, right? Like it's just way too expensive. And so I think some things that yeah, we what is there like one point four trillion dollars of student loan debt? I think. Yeah, I mean that number it, it it's like surpassed everything else, right? Home debt, um, credit card <laughs> debt. But I think some things that we know work that colleges don't have, right? We know. People like speed in education. They like the fact that it's fast. They get to really get deep into something and they get to explore it and see if they like it or not. I can't tell you how many engineering majors we have from like materials engineering, bioengineering. Hey, that was hot in 2010, but I didn't like it. But you know how hard it is to kind of switch to CS three years into a Cornell degree? Like it's impossible. Mm -hmm. And so we have, you know, speed is important. Immersion is really important, right? I think people, you know, we're not, I'm not saying our, our attention spans are shorter these days, but... Immersion has always been better. I mean, yeah. it's like if you move to, you know, if you if you move to China, it's just much much easier to learn Chinese. Um, People love like that immersive aspect. Mm -hmm. Community is important, right? And I think that students find that at um, at school and things like the ACM group that you know Nim and I were really involved in ACM at U of I. We were really involved in the IEEE, um, and so. But, you know, in, in classes, there's not really much fostering of community. It's almost like every man for himself, right? You don't break the curve or don't um, you don't want to help people hurt the curve. Mm -hmm. And so I think those things work here that um, make education, you know, really fun, immersive. And in truth, in college, like they give you a lot of great theory. And I think, you know, I think things like Coursera are great for later on in your career. I, I go back to those courses sometimes and say, hey, let me let me deepen my knowledge in this particular piece of theory. But it's because I want to apply it to something that I'm excited about. And in college, you're kind of left to put together, like, you're not powerful. You just know a lot of things. And you can't actually do anything. And I think once you can do something and you feel that power, learning is, like, a hundred times more fun, right? It's, right, because you're incentivized. You know, you want to learn, and then you, you know you can apply whatever you learn. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I can't – I mean, I remember studying all night – about cylindrical, like polar coordinate math to study how hard drives spin in a in an operating system. I'm like, do I ever care about how hard drives are spinning? And then so, um, to me, that was like a case of where I'm learning stuff because at some point in the '70s it was important for operating system <laughs> authors, but I would never use it. Um, now we don't even have, you know, circular disk anymore, so um, that knowledge is. It's functionally useless. But, you know, the power is really important, I think, to students feel like, hey, I can do what I, I'm seeing I want myself to do, right? I can make a website. I can build a mobile app. I can make a video game. Yeah, that's, man, that's more torturous than any particular thing I remember learning, polar coordinates for disks. Um, so, I mean, you mentioned MOOCs. Do you see the future of coding boot camps becoming more virtual or more MOOC-like? How, how could MOOCs complement coding boot camps? I think that uh, we'll definitely see more kind of a la carte education. Um, and I think that 
people have recognized that you know you're, you can't just stop learning at 22, right? We're constantly in a, we're in a very competitive world for intellectual uh, and knowledge skills, and so MOOCs are great for that. I think that you know there is still um, an incredible power to learning um, in the real world with real people teaching you with community that's that you can see and talk to and um, you know even go out after after class and um, kind of throw a frisbee around and stuff like that. So um, I, I don't think that the classroom and education is going all online, but I think online is going to be very powerful for continuing education um, throughout your entire career. Um, and I don't think that I, I mean, I, I don't think college is dead either. I think people people value college for a lot more than just learning. In fact, learning is probably not even the top three things that you get out of college that they're excited about. So do you have any like interesting success stories about people who have graduated from Full Stack Academy and gone on to do really big things? So we have a lot of um, stories about people who've gone to work at great companies. We have you know people who've gone to companies as small as um, the third man in the startup to working at Google, Goldman Sachs, Facebook, um, Facebook Dropbox. Dropbox. Yeah. Um, so we have, you know, I don't. I think there's no uncharted territory anymore of people who are CS students only can mm-hmm. go to these kind of companies and boot camp students can't. So I think that I think is something that we've uh, we've seen. We have a lot of students, not a lot, maybe one or two every cohort who do um, who found companies. Um, we have some. I mean, I have, I'm actually the advisor to a few companies. Um, we have one student who went back to Hong Kong, started a um, kind of like a pivotal labs consulting firm called Altitude Labs. Now they represent Riot Games in all of Asia. So wow. Riot Games, so yeah, it's like a 30 person company now. Um, and so, you know, th- those are stories that I think we don't select people to be good founders and s- or we don't, we don't necessarily look at that when they come. So, um, you know, I think, I think founders is a different a different skill set, and so, um, but we do have some of that, uh, and just you know, a lot of great companies. But I, I mean, I would say we do select smart and passionate people, and, and I think that you know, and I think this is also something that normal good colleges benefit from is that if you if you select really smart and passionate people, like they're gonna do great things in life in general. Like it's not, I mean, I don't even know if we can take credit for all the cool things that they do after full stack because I feel like they're just people who are constantly like you know. Um, thinking about like great things to do, and I know that they're going to do they're going to do great things, and it it's it's fulfilling to just know them. I mean, we can take credit for their like their their engineering knowledge, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, but other than that, I think they're you know they we we I'm definitely um, proud of and really enjoy working with uh, all oh, the we, students here. Yeah, we have one student actually whose company recently raised several hundred million, right? Wealth Simple. Yeah, but it's not his. I mean, he he was one of the early engineers. Okay, yeah. So yeah. yeah, he's one of the early engineers. He moved to the company when they was very small. They recently raised several hundred million, I think. So uh, those kind of. St- and then I I found out because I saw that he's giving a talk at um, Empire Node, uh, a Node JS conference in New York. And so um, those kind of stories are really really heartening. Yeah, that is heartening. And I think I saw some statistic that like ninety seven percent of your graduates get jobs like right out of the academy. Yeah. Um, we we focus a lot on um, placement and tracking students and making sure that they're getting connected to great companies, um, and we've seen great success. I think um, more and more companies are looking to full stack um, and saying that these are great. This is a, an amazing pool of talent that um, you know can come into my company, be productive right away, and. I mean, almost by going to a boot camp, you prove yourself to be very excited about learning, um, definitely a hard worker. Um, and so they, yeah, a lot of companies are you know, coming to us almost as like a, not an exclusive source of talent, but as a source of talent they're really excited about. So this show is a episode that is part of a week of shows about Y Combinator. Y Combinator is a startup accelerator that invests in the early stages of tech companies I do want to talk about your experience in Y Combinator. When you first applied, what did your product do? So when we first applied, we were actually, uh, ironically, we were building something to um, to help people not code in the sense that, you know, like we were we were building a uh, we were building an, an interface to allow professionals to create uh, code like programs by just dragging and dropping uh, things. Um, and I think, you know, as we were building this, you know, and with our trial users, 
um, what we discovered is that it's actually not that hard to just learn how to code. And it, actually, you know, if you try to build anything really complicated, um, like the visual diagram of that gets almost, you know, almost unmanageably more complicated than the actual code itself. Um, and so in our part time, we, uh, yeah, I mean, so, you know, basically that's what we were doing when we, uh, when we first started at YC. So why did you decide to kind of change your product? You know, I mean, I guess, um, that's one of the, that's one of the fun things and, and one of the really common things that happens at YC and really just in startups in general, like our, your main goal as an entrepreneur is to find, um, you know, that product and market fit. It's like, what is the right product and, and what is the right market for that product? Um, and I think we, what we found is that, is that, you know, people wanting to learn how to code is just, um, I mean, I guess it, it was just a, a lot bigger, bigger market and, and a lot like larger impact possibility than, um, you know, th than what we were building uh, earlier. And so and I think what we found, too, is that, you know, you um, I really like that quote by Steve Jobs that the computer is the bicycle for the mind. And so people, you know, we want to give people more power with computers. And it's it's not so much, you know, the interface. It's not if you're writing JavaScript, you're writing, you know, you're dragging blocks around in a programming environment. None of that is really important if you don't have the computational thinking required to mm -hmm. lay that out, you know, and to express that, express your ideas in a clear, concise way that computers can can understand and work with. And so I think that we, um, it's like how do we teach, how do we give people more computational thinking power? And we just started exploring that. Um, this model really excited us about. You know what? Let's not let's not try to make computers down to um, not let's not try to make tools that kind of blur that let's just make people better at communicating with computers did y combinator help you solve any engineering challenges or was it mostly like product and fundraising strategy you know i mean uh, honestly the the founder i mean the uh, well uh definitely the founders but but also the partners at at yc are are incredibly knowledgeable at both of those things that you mentioned like there are some incredible engineers there um, as partners and also incredible uh, product thinkers and, and, and business thinkers. And so they really can help you with, with both of those problems. But um, especially with the first one, which is engineering problems, one of the biggest benefits was having access to, you know, this like incredible community of other founders who are all pretty much um, kind of hand selected to be like amazing engineers. And so just about any technical challenge we faced, um, you know, there was someone who could help us. Um, and 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 I guess even even with the like like the the network also really helped out with um, you know with with questions with uh, as far as business strategy is concerned and so I, I think they really help you with with both. Yeah, I would say the the reasons to go to YC are definitely not for the money. It's for the um, the network of both you know kind of connecting to connecting you to venture capital, connecting you to uh, key angels, connecting key technical people, um, and then. The sense of community. I mean, I think doing a startup is, in the end, still a very difficult, um, a difficult journey for anyone to take. And so, having a community of people who are going through that with you is also very helpful. Um, and I think that everyone in YC comes with great sense of like great intuition about startups, the challenges that startups face. And so, being able to get that kind of feedback is um, is huge. And I'll give you a funny story of of the connections that YC can give you. Is that um, Early on, when React Native was getting really popular, and everyone was like asking for um, access to it, and to, you know, tell people, tell you, tell me more about it. Um, Pete Hunt is one of the as a YC founder, and he's one of the you know core members of the React team. And so he's like, yeah, just email me, I'll get you an invite. And so that kind of like connections into Dropbox, Facebook, Google. That's also a big part of the YC network. Hmm. Interesting. What was the most counterintuitive advice that you got at Y Combinator? I think this is, I mean, this is a cliche at this point, but um, it's definitely do things that don't scale is, I mean, as especially, this is especially something that engineers have a problem with, right? Because we think only in terms of scale, right? We, we think, here's a problem, can I codify it into something that can be done a billion times easily? And so we think in, exclusively in terms of scale. Um, and I think sometimes it almost helps to talk to a person who doesn't know how to code and say, how would you run this business? And they would say, you know what? I would get two Excel files. I would have someone in, you know, 
like someone cut and paste when this order happens from this Excel file to that Excel file. <laughs> I'll mail that Excel file to my shipping. You know, like that's the kind of stuff that before you build an entire app, you know, infrastructure of software to do it, just make sure that people want it. Yeah. And so uh, the t-shirts they give you the first day you get there is make, is it make stuff people want. Or, make something some people want. Yeah, make something people want. So I think I believe that you know early on if you make something people want, that's a lot of other problems can be solved. And I, people will fight about things like founder equity. You know how much we should be spending on marketing, how do we get these this like this particular advisor here. It's like that stuff is important, but you, that's like to me, that's like bottom line. I can't fix a top line issue, which is if no one wants your product, you're dead in the water to begin with. You know, I, I actually just as as David was speaking, I you know, I I was reflecting and I and I and I realized that one of the one of the best things that YC does for a founder is really simplify um is really simplify a lot of things for you because you know things are so there's so many moving parts and there's so many complicated paths that you could be taking. Like um, on the first day of YC, Paul Graham told us that you know you should only be doing three things while you're at YC: either coding, talking to your customers, or taking care of your health. Um, and 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 I think you know it's advice like that. I mean, there's a lot of other other advice I can think of like that. That that he's like, if you're doing anything that doesn't fit into these three categories, you should tell yourself that you know this is probably not the right three months to be doing that um, and so it's like something like that um, and also in also what David said is that you know make something people want um, it's like it sounds really obvious and, and simple but it's actually a very very high bar to cross it's that you know people want doesn't mean people say they want it doesn't mean people maybe want it means that people are like willing to put down their credit card and they actually want it doesn't mean what um, you can what you can fulfill right a lot of yeah. times people think that way too um, and so it's it's a, it's actually very simple, but it's a really high bar to cross. And I think that you know YC kind of simplifies the thought process for founders. And I think that that that's very um, that's very valuable. A, a lot of the advice that Y Combinator has given has become codified, and it's been you know republished in Sam Altman's posts or Paul Graham's posts. But it sounds like this is sort of um, the same thing in Full Stack Academy where it helps to be immersed. And in Y Combinator, it sounds like you just get completely immersed in this, uh, you know, environment that uh, embodies all these things that, that these guys write about. Or, you know, uh, you know yeah. you, that, that, what is it, that How to Start a Startup podcast that was really good. I mean, it'd be like being immersed in that type of material for, what is it, three months? I mean, you really hit it on the nail that, that it's actually that, content in like in today's uh, information economy basically like you know content or information is pretty much free right like there's no um, like there's there's no value to actually us like giving you just a, a lecture on JavaScript functions because you can already buy that for twelve dollars you know at on Amazon like it's not really the content and that's the same thing about YC that you know if you just read Paul Graham's posts um, you know all his articles that, that he writes like you'll pretty much be able to get all the advice that he gives during YC um, but you're absolutely right that the, the immersion and and the community of people who who are all equally passionate and if not more um, that that keep pushing you forward I think that that is just uh, invaluable one one thing that I think Paul Graham told us on the first day that I, I really came to see you know quite often is that he calls himself like a pure function right um, same input in same input same input out and so um, if you you know you tell him you, you in your in your meetings with him you tell him here's the status of the things that we're worried about and he'll give you advice on what to do next and if you give he says if you come back to me with the same exact things I'm gonna tell you the same thing and the only thing the only state that I have is that if I do that too many times I have a sense that you're failing because you're not learning new things and so I also believe that um, the advice that he gives, it's hard to codify all of it at one time because he's such a, like a, you know, it's like he's such a, it's still a human process of, right? He has all this intuition. He's seen these problems a hundred times before and he remembers it almost like at a gut level, right? That mm -hmm. it would be hard for him to even say, oh, this reminds me of when Airbnb was driving down to get advice from Emmett, <laughs> right? Like he won't remember that. He'll just feel it. But the other thing I think that makes YC valuable is that, you know, advice Advice, I think, is a function of the quality of the advice multiplied by the credibility of the giver of the advice, mm -hmm. multiplied by how good you are at taking it, right? And so we are like the worst advice givers to ourselves because we're so good at deluding ourselves. But <laughs> you take someone like Paul Graham and he gives you great advice. He has a huge amount of credibility. 
And, um, you know, people t are tend to set up to want to take his advice. And so he, he drives companies in a good way. So I think that there's value to being there beyond the content, beyond the immersion of working with these really, you know, um, highly tuned people. Because most people have seen from a, most advisors you get, you know, they've seen three or four startups. Are there VCs and they've seen 15 startups? These people have seen, I don't say 500 to 1,000 startups. So they know kind of. I mean, especially at that phase, like the startup phase, um, I think they're just incredible. Um, yeah. They're just incredible, like at that. Because, it, 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 you know, that phase is actually very different than another phase in, in, um, in a company. Um, and it has very unique challenges. So this canonical idea of doing things that don't scale, this looks like it applies pretty wholeheartedly to Full Stack Academy because, you know, when I think about Full Stack Academy, it sounds like a business that is hard to scale because you have to, you know, if you wanted to scale to other states, you know, you would need more instructors and you, there's all these scalability problems. But, you know, many times in these types of business, um, that can be kind of, you know, deceptive. Maybe in some ways there are economies of scale that you don't notice unless you are in on the inside looking out. So I'm curious, what are the types of ways that will allow you to eventually move beyond this uh, sort of high friction to towards scalability? Like, how, what kinds of economies of scale will you get as you uh, move towards whatever your your vision of the end game of Full Stack Academy is? Well, I think that um, you know we can't, I guess, give away all our secrets, but there there are. I think exactly as you described, right? Like we started and just said, let's run everything as high touch um, as we can, and then um, see what are the scale points and what are things that don't scale. I think things that are that don't scale well, and I think that we don't want to scale, is the interaction that people have with great instructors, um, great mentors in the community. Uh, so that's something that I think we'll continue to providing to our students as we um, get larger and larger. And I think that that's a lot about what we don't do and what we don't want our instructors and our mentors to do. Um, that academic institutions, you know, academic institutions use professors for all kinds of things, right? Beyond just instruction. Like research. Yeah, so research. it's a little bit about what, what we say no to. And, um, you know, also I think that content is something that we've learned more and more. How do we get people to use content effectively at the right time, the right piece of content, um, so that they they can continue to, um, but you know, as, as Nim has said, content converges our content scales very well. And so I think those are some things that we're able to um, use as vectors of scale. Um, and I think in education, culture and operations is important too, right? How do you create a culture that um, feels, you know, immersive even as you grow? That's something that we're, we're building internal tools, internal operations tools around um, optimizing for. When you were talking to people at Y Combinator and getting an idea of what the future of coding boot camps and computer science education looks like. Are, are there any interesting visions for, you know, how people think this is going to pan out? Like, is everybody just going to start programming? So I think um, there's a few YC partners who are very involved in education. And so um, they've thought about the future of education in a lot of different ways. I think that there's, you know, there's no, um, there's definitely large institutional educations that have scaled up and are very large. And so I don't think there's a, a sense that education itself can't scale, right? Even all the educational institutions that we've, we're familiar with, they're, they're very large um, institutions that, so education itself can scale. I think what people are looking at is, um, you know, how do we, one thing that um, no one, I think, has cracked the code yet is, what's the word? Um, kind of effectiveness. Right, so you can put on world class Harvard classes online and get like five percent completion rates. That's not really, um, you know, it's it's fine, but it's not really kind of solving the education problem of getting people to fix that. So that's one thing that people are Is attrition. The word you're looking for? Yeah, I think there's just really heavy. Thank you. There's really heavy attrition in education or in online content delivery right now. Um, people are also looking at things like knowing what people know. Right, that's really hard. And programmers have traditionally re re resisted that um, kind of certification or accreditation. Um, and I think that, you know, it's like it's hard to know what it's hard to know what uh, what certificates mean um, as as they as a certificate 
begins to mean more and more, right? So we have a sense of what an MIT CS grad knows and what that means that they got that certificate, but it doesn't necessarily translate to any skills that I might need right now, right? Um, and so that's something that um, people are also looking to in education. But I think those are the key things, right? Giving it so that we can understand better how people are learning, why they're not learning, and how, why they're dropping out at certain points, and then what they actually know when they're done learning. Something that's kind of orthogonal to this discussion, but what do you think of the hiring practices of companies like the high pressure whiteboard scenarios that um, you know graduates are are put into people who are applying to jobs for the first time? Do you think this is an effective way of hiring people? So you know, it's something funny is that um, if I if I look at your uh, your podcast, and I, I think you know there's some really awesome um, content and episodes there. So I'm, um, I, I look at kind of how programmers that are, you know, working in these companies right now, like senior engineers right now who are 30 to 40, how were they created? And I, you know, this I only say this story for myself, and, and I think it applies to Nimit too. But we almost gravitate towards computers like accidentally, right? A parent might have put one in our house, we started playing with it, and really fell in love with it. We started doing HTML sites for our friends back in, you know, some people for some people was MySpace. For me, it was GeoCities, you know, and it's like playing with HTML, CSS, and some jQuery. And it's just kind of accidental how the United States is creating software engineers. And you look at a first year CS program, and we view those classes almost um, with pride as like dropout classes or weed out classes, right? So the United States is in no way or shape or form like actively trying to create great engineers in a scalable way, right? It was like we accidentally create them at youth. We have no STEM programs, K through 12. And you know, thankfully, that's changing. And then in school, we weed them out as aggressively as we can. And then whoever's left gets to be programmers. And so I think that... Um, it's really perverse. Yeah, right? It's kind of funny like how, how we view the creation of a, of a skill that I think will be increasingly needed. And so I think that the whiteboard interviews is part and parcel of that entire culture, right? Like, we expect you to know X, Y, and Z, because I know X, Y, and Z, and I passed this whiteboard interview. Um, and so I think that that's where, um, you know, I don't think that they're, they do show a lot of things, right? Can you think on your feet? Do you, but it's, it's almost more. No, it's like, it's it, like, can you memorize something? It's like the SAT taken to the extreme. Yeah. And I think that it's, you know, it's part of our shared culture, whether or not that, you know, and that's not to say culture is good, right? It's like, it's part of our shared culture. I think it does, um, we are seeing different methods of interviewing. I like a lot of things. I like these project-based interviews. I like GitHub um, interviews. Although that's hard to scale because you usually need an engineer to look at that. I like um, kind of these three-month or trial contracts before you hire. I think all these things are improving kind of just, I mean, I've gone through my share of whiteboard interviews and I'm like, did I really forget how to reverse a string in, on the whiteboard? No, I mean, obviously I know how to reverse a string, but in a very high pressure situation, you're like, you kind of blank. Um, which is nothing like actually programming in the wild. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think, yeah, it's nothing like programming in the wild. It's it's our shared culture. I think it has a lot of flaws, and I think that we're seeing improvements in it, but um, it's still definitely very prevalent. Great. Well, David and Nimit, thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily. It's been a blast talking to you guys about Full Stack Academy. Yeah, yeah. Hey, best of luck uh, with with YC. Uh, let us Thanks. help and keep up the great work with the podcast. I really, um, really like the topics you've chosen and the people you've um, brought on. Thank you.